Okay. I, I think I'll start by, um, well, here's the book, <laughs> Legends of Barnet, and it's called um, Legends of Barnet, Vermont History, Mystery, Curiosities, and Culture of a Small Vermont Town. And um, I have lived in Barnet for probably now seven years. I've lived in Vermont for 46 years. And um, when I moved to Barnet, like I do to any, any community, I've lived in Pittsford, Thetford, um, Fairley for a long time, and then came to Barnet. I um, have always been curious about the history of any place that I lived in. And um, that, that was brought home to me when I actually, a couple of months ago, I Googled myself. I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but I was shocked at what I found, a lot of which <laughs> had to do with letters to the editor that had to do with history of wherever I lived. So there were Rutland Daily Herald letters and letters to the Valley News. <laughs> and, you know, you forget about stuff like that. You don't realize that, you know, while you're churning through your busy work day and trying to get through your career and put the chicken on the table, you forget that you were doing all this stuff in the background. So Googling myself reminded me of a lot of stuff that I was really surprised about. When I moved to Barnet, um, one of the first places, because as Lenny knows, I'm a kayaker and a swimmer, um, that I went to was to the town beach. And at the town beach, there is a big sign, if you have never been there, that it um, says that um, this was the place of Jacques Cousteau's first dive. And I thought, wow, that is like totally amazing. Um, what's the story behind that? So I started asking the people with whom I was who I was getting to know here in the community, what's the story behind Jacques Cousteau's first dive? And what I got was a lot of um, uncertainty and um, I wasn't satisfied with any answer that I got. I, and when I'm not satisfied, I go to look it up. And when I went to look it up, um, I found a story told in all these books, whether they were adult books, whether they were comments by Jacques Cousteau himself, or whether they were books for children about Jacques Cousteau, that he came to Barnet when he was 10 years old and took his first dive. And um, so, you know, I noted that. And as I was going through that exploratory process, trying to uncover the history of Jacques time here so that it would be more than a couple of sentences in a book um, because I thought there must be a story there. Um, I ran into um, mention of the German camp which for which to read about that I had to buy my way into the FBI files in order to read the German files, they're called the German files of World War I, pr just prior to and throughout World War I. And I thought, what the heck? There was an investigation by the then called Bureau of Investigation here in Barnet on a camp run by a couple of professors of German, they were German <laughs> professors, one of them actually was an alien. Um, he, he did not have citizenship. Um, and the other was a citizen of, of the United States, but with, with a German background. And um, so the story of Jacques Cousteau was like starting to grow like Topsy. I, it was amazing. And I, and I just persisted uh, in trying to find out what happened with Jacques. And one of the places that I went to verify that he indeed was here in um, 1920, which was the story that was told because Jacques always told the story by saying that he was 10 years old. So people did the math and put him here in 1920. But I went to the ship manifest um, documents and found that he didn't arrive 
until December 1920 and didn't attend camp here then until 1921. And then I was able to also track down who it was, which one of the uh, counselors it was, because he, Jacques would talk about this Mr. Betts, B-O-E-T-Z is how they would spell it in, um, in the books. And what an awful camp counselor he was. And he would insist that Jacques ride horses and Jacques hated horses. And so because Jacques would, I guess, temperamentally put his foot down, um, the camp counselor made him go to the waterfront and clean the waterfront so that there wouldn't be like fallen pieces of, of tree debris and weeds and what have you. So that the diving area for the uh, campers, all of whom were boys and all of, yeah, all of whom were boys, um, would be nice and clean. And that's how he started diving or so it goes. <laughs> but I also found out that he'd been swimming for quite a long time in Paris or, or in France, um, his father was uh, an assistant. He was an attorney and he was an assistant to an American expatriate named Henry Higgins. And uh, he, um, Jacques was a frail child and Higgins thought that he would build up his stamina if he were to swim and Higgins had yachts and so they spent a lot of time by the waterfront near these yachts. And Higgins was the one who actually got Jacques Cousteau started and swimming and probably diving. But we don't want to spoil the claim to fame <laughs> that we have here. Um, one of the exciting things in doing that chapter, and excuse me while I um, go to page 128, was... Um, I looked all over for a picture of Jacques as a little boy. I just could not uncover anything. And I was in touch with the Cousteau Society, of course, and they couldn't come up with pictures of Jacques as a little boy. So um, this one day I was on um, the town of Barnet, the community site on Facebook, and suddenly our librarian at that time, um, Sherry Tola, uh, was assistant, she was the assistant librarian, posted a picture, and here it is. And a gentleman named Vogelman had walked into the library and said, you might be interested in this. So she scanned the picture, which is of his father, this Robert Vogelman's father, with Jacques Cousteau as the little boy with his arm around Bob Vogelman, Vigelman, and, um, and there was my picture, which even the Cousteau Society had never seen. And so there I was. Where this led most recently is even odder than that. Um, this picture was published in an article that ran a few weeks ago when the book came out. And it was in the Caledonian Record in a nice article that was written by Amy Ash Nixon. And there happened to be a woman visiting her parents in St. Johnsbury, who is working on a documentary for the National Geographic and for the Cousteau Society. And her mother <laughs> brought this to her attention. She said, Aren't you working on a, on a Cousteau story? Look at this article. And so now I've been in touch <laughs> with the filmmakers, the Cousteau Society and National Geographic because they want to use the information that's in my chapter because of course they didn't have the story either. What I learned too and, and when stories get repeated and repeated and repeated and nobody goes to check out the facts, that just drives me crazy. So um, what people, what authors were doing was cutting and pasting from one source to another source. They became yet a new source of the wrong story. And this taught me a great deal while I was writing the book that I could not become complacent in the least. 
about the information that I was thinking was accurate <laughs> and which when put to the test might prove not to be. So one of the things I work toward as any historian should, and I don't mean to say that I'm an, an historian by any means, but um, is to check the accuracy of the story that's told because the story behind the inaccuracies that are printed out there might be far more interesting than the cut and paste that authors seem willing to do. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Does anybody have any questions or do you just want me to keep burbling? <laughs> keep going? Well, I, I was just wondering, that I, you didn't mention was how do you think the bottle story got to be the common story? Wasn't that the common story that he was sent to pick up the bottles under the diving? No? I never read anything about bottles. Oh, okay. No, it was always uh, debris. So, I, I, no, I, there may be a bottle story out there, but there are a number of stories out there, a lot of which, if you're familiar with the, um, and, and I know that the uh, literal, the shore can change over time, but one of the stories that was um, often noted in those cut and paste paragraphs about his time at camp in Vermont was that um, he also got his idea for the aqua lung because he pulled reeds from the, uh, water side and use the reeds to breathe underwater longer in order for him to be able to clear the debris from the edge of the um, lake. But if you're familiar with swimming <laughs> um, in Barnet, and I've gone swimming right at the site of where his, where the camp was that he attended, um, it's shallow and I have no reason to believe that it's any more shallow now than it was then or that it was deeper then than it is now. I, but um, one would not have to hold one's breath for an overly long period of time. And he never told that story about the reeds. That was something that some author <laughs> um, inserted in, into the cut and paste paragraph and then everybody ran with it. Kathleen, mm -hmm. I heard the bottle story. You, you heard the bottle story? Yeah, 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 I took your book down to a, a, you know, a trip to the beach with my son-in-law and my daughter and their little girl. Uh -huh. And the son-in-law said, so is it really true that he was being punished for something and they made him dive for bottles and clear all the bottles out from underneath the dock? Because he'd been throwing bottles, all the kids threw bottles into the water. And I said, let me look it up. <laughs> So you're now the source. It was great to have your book at hand. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. But he, he, that's what he'd heard. Huh, yeah, well, there are a lot of things that people have heard. And then when you put them to the test of, you know, logic and accuracy and I don't know, there could have been bottles in there. Who knows? But no, no you're, you're much more plausible. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was another thing was... Uh, Johanna, I was another thing was, um, is this plausible? Did it make sense? That was an, another guiding, a beacon in the, in the way of, by way of um, doing the investigations into the accuracy of the stories. Morris, did you have a question? Yeah, um, in places I think Harvey Lake is very deep. And yes. So this great dive just took place along the edges where he was able to use a reed for, for breathing? Well, the reed for breathing is a story that he never told. He never said anything about having used a reed. That was a story that someone somewhere extrapolated from God knows what because it's not in anything that Jacques Cousteau ever said. Uh -huh. he, he never said I was inspired to invent the aqua lung because I used a read on uh, Harvey Lake. <laughs> it, just, it just didn't, that just, I mean, if that was part of his story, it's not recorded 
anywhere in English or French. So, <laughs> but he was diving without any kind of equipment. Correct. He was just diving as any. He had just turned eleven that June, I believe it was, and and it was he would have arrived here uh, somewhere between uh, around July one, and he was just an eleven-year-old kid who, whose um, horseback counselor, Mr. Betts, insisted that he ride the horses, and he evidently put up a stink and Beth said then you will you will dive <laughs> <laughs> yeah the camp the camp was originally it was founded in 1916 the camp that he went to um, um, by Otto Schinnerer and um, Henry Reza R-E-E-S-E -E -E, and um, they were as I indicated both professors of German um, Reza was at that time at uh, University is it Kansas University of Kansas in Lawrence, and um, uh, Schinnerer was at Ohio the Ohio State University. Never say Ohio State without the. And um, uh, they had they had met as camp counsel summer camp counselors at a camp that still exists on Hall's Pond in Newberry, a girls camp. And they came up with the idea because of the um, attitude that was uh, changing vigorously in the United States around the time of World War I, um, which involved antipathy uh, on the part, that's probably putting it mildly, toward Germans whether you were a nate uh, you know born and naturalized born here and naturalized here or especially if you came here um and were not naturalized you were suspect as being one of the enemy and um anyway the there were many states um ohio nebraska a number of other states where there was an option in German neighborhoods, German settled neighborhoods, um, to have German spoken in school. It was either that instruction was both in English and German, or in some schools it was all in German, but these were public schools. And as we were approaching World War I and the World War was underway in Europe, um, the attitude changed radically and um, it was forbidden for the use of German in the public schools that had previously had um, German as one of the languages in which the teaching took place. So parents of children with German backgrounds, German ethnic heritage and pride, wanted their children to continue to be exposed to the German language and were being denied that because of the prejudice against Germans in this country at the time. And these two guys saw this as an opportunity to open a camp at which German would be the main language. And they were immediately, they, they were immediately suspect in Barnet and all the surrounding communities. There was an uprising there were multiple letters as this German files that I got access to that are um, held by the FBI. Um, multiple letters were written reporting that these guys were up to no good. They were in fact, <laughs> they were in fact said to be building aeroplanes on Devil's Hill in Peacham. And that they were storing these aeroplanes in the caves up on the up on Devil's Hill, and that they were going to fly these planes down the Connecticut River, and they were preparing to bomb the armaments factories that were along the Connecticut River. That's just one example of, I would call it an hysteria. <laughs> that loomed over the area. And there were 40 men 
from the surrounding communities, Peachum, Rygate, Barnet, um, St. Johnsbury, who um, entered into a pact to burn down the camp. And the local minister here the, at the West Barnet Presbyterian Church was trying to keep a lid on things. And so um, he was trying to talk sense into these people. Unfortunately, they did not burn the camp down. Um, but um, it was a really rough time. It was quite the uh, quite a difficult decision that these guys probably unwittingly made. I, I don't think that they had a shred of an idea as they embarked on this camp idea that they were going to end up in so much soup. <laughs> so it was fa fascinating looking into it and reading it and reading. Oh gosh, oh like an investigation was undertaken. You can go down to the camp uh, now and you can see where a tennis court is. Uh, it's a private home now. Um, it belongs to Carla Cornelius and her husband. And, and her father was a camp counselor at the time that Jacques Cousteau was there. Uh, he too was from the Ohio State University. And, um, uh, they sent agents, FBI agents, down to the camp because there was a rumor that there was a big Bertha that was being manufactured underneath the um, tennis court. <laughs> so agents were dispatched, and all the and the agents were not necessarily hired by the FBI. There were all these policing groups that were made up of citizens who allied themselves with the FBI and would get an assignment to go and ferret out um, and report on and bring to justice the people who were speaking German, let's say at a picnic in a park. Um, uh, teachers had to sign um, they had to sign pledges that they would not speak a word of German in the classroom. Um, oh, it, it was an amazing, it was amazing to learn about it all. And one of the things that struck me was that my mom, um, who lived in an Irish and German neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, way back in the 20s, um, often told me about the um, the kids who spoke German at home and um, that schools in her neighborhood had German, um, some German instruction or that they used to have some German instruction. And I, you know, you dismiss these things as your mother says, but a germ of it kind of stuck in my head. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is what mom was talking about. And so before she died, um, uh, and I was writing this book, I said to her, tell me about that, you know, back in your neighborhood in Cleveland and, and the German in the schools. And she said, well, they didn't speak German when I went to school. You know, that was, that was before World War I when they spoke German, but they came down on them. And it was just terrible, she said. It was just awful. If you ordered a German newspaper or a, or a German um, magazine, which were quite popular, among the German population in this country, um, which was one of the largest ethnic groups, um, you were suspect. So people dropped, they dropped going to their social clubs, they dropped going anywhere that would suggest that they had any pride in Germany or, or their German heritage, because they were not interested in the Kaiser they were interested in their own German heritage as Americans. It seems like you have accumulated enough material to go off and write another book, maybe not necessarily a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that cracked me up was this book came out on the 4th of July, and I would venture to say it was about the 7th of July that people started asking me what what was going to be in the next book or started giving me suggestions <laughs> and i am like 
whew, you know, just, just came off the press, guys. Give me a break. But I, I have taken every suggestion and I have a folder <laughs> into which I have put all the suggestions of what they would love me to look into. <laughs> and some of them are quite tantalizing, I have to say, but whether I'll summon the uh, energy to go off on this. I, I, this one day when um, I was, you know, set out to just find out the story of Jacques Cousteau, that was all I wanted to know. <laughs> and, and, um, and then that led, you know, on, like so surprisingly to the German files. And then I read those and I'm sharing it with Frank who's right over there <laughs> and I said Frank you know I can't really like justify keeping this to myself all this information that I'm getting because I started to share it I'm sure I was a total bore at dinner parties and stuff like that <laughs> I started saying you know what the real have you ever heard of the German camp you know what the real story is behind Jacques Cousteau and um and people didn't know and I thought well, there is this vast abyss of knowledge that's not filled, and we better get the story straight. And I turned to Frank and I said, I think I'm writing a book. And that was, that was the start of it. I mean, I had no intention of writing a book, but I suddenly had such an accumulation of information so how did you travel the path from Jacques Cousteau to the Hells Angels? Oh, well, okay. One of the things that I did from the very beginning, because that was how I got set, how I set out on this whole thing, was to involve people in the community in conversations, to ask them, what did they remember? What did they know? What stories did they hear? And so I was standing, Oh, where was I? St standing somewhere <laughs> in a driveway, probably talking to some guy. And he said, well, you're going to tell the story of the Hells Angels, aren't you? And I had no idea there was a story about Hells Angels. And so I started asking him questions. Then I started putting questions up on the um, Barnet community site, the For Love of Peachum. Um, I think the Rygate listserv and stuff like that. And I said, what do you guys know about the time when the Hell's Angels were in Barnet? And of course I went to all the newspapers. I spent a lot of time at the state libraries and at the FNAM and elsewhere. Um, and um, so I was getting, you know, how it was reported in the newspaper. Um, whose land it was, I then called their surviving children and asked, what's the story about your dad being offered a sum of money um, to sell a plot of land along the lake to the Hells Angels? <laughs> and um, once I had accumulated all of that information, um, that's, that was how it got launched. People were, people were very excited to tell about the times that they either rode with, drank with, partied with, swam with, the often naked Hells Angels, they did not prefer to wear bathing suits, or they, um, uh, um, uh, one of my great resources was the guy um, here in town whose um, property they ended up on, they did not buy the land that they first set out to buy, but they settled where um, Roy's campground is um, on the lake. And, oh, uh, that's the Bay of Pigs. Okay, <laughs> just as a point for Lenny there. Um, and um, he was an absolute a great resource because these guys, the Hells Angels who came up here in the summer and thankfully did not do any harm. They were called gentlemen. Everybody to whom I spoke referred to them as being gentlemen. When they were away from Barnet, they were slaughtering people. But when they were here, thankfully, they stayed as gentlemen. And they were helping 
this fellow who's still alive, um, to Hay, and he knew the names of every last one of them, often what they did for work. He was an incredible resource, just incredible. But he learned some things from the chapter <laughs> that he didn't know because he, were, he really wasn't aware of what these guys were up to when they weren't here. So that was, that was how I got into the Hells Angels. And the Hells Angels chapter, let's see, uh, has great pictures <laughs> of the guys who were here. here the, like, here they are, the bad boys, those gentlemen right there. And, um, I have to thank my formatter, Kevin Proctor. He uh, lives in Rygate. And um, uh, I had a bunch of pictures that I had uh, gotten from newspapers, but the quality was really poor. Um, and of course, if you're formatting a quality book, you, you want to use, I learned this, uh, a 600 to 900 at least DPI, if not 1200, which is the registration of the picture. And um, it was he who then uh, contacted the Lowell Sun in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is where the uh, chapter of the Hells Angels was from, and uh, managed to get the photographs. He even talked to the photographer, now retired, who was the beat photographer for the Hells Angels in Lowell. They were the second um, chapter of the Hells Angels outside of, um, was it Sonny Bar Barger, I think it is his name, um, out of California. They were the first one in New England, the Lowell chapter, the guys who came up here. And this is in 19, they came here in 1968. So that's, that's that one. I had an, a lot of fun doing this one, this chapter about Scottish clocks. Um, these clocks are about uh, anywhere from um, 200 to 215 years old. And I took the, you know, I was reading the book, um, the History of Barnet, Vermont, which was written in 1918, but not published or printed, not printed until 1923. But uh, in that book, they tell about um, five families who owned clocks that they brought either the works or the entire clock, including its case, um, from Scotland when they settled here. This was a Scottish settlement. And um, very unusual in Vermont. There are only three, Rygate, Barnet, and Craftsbury. And um, the, uh, I thought, wow, so there were these clocks back in 1918 that were still ticking that had been brought from Scotland. I wonder if I could figure out where those clocks are now. And I managed to track down four out of five of the clocks. And um, and you know, thank God to Ancestry and the White Pages and <laughs> um, uh, detective work. Um, uh, I was able to figure out. I was able to go through the generations and kind of um, deduce who might have inherited the clock, and then that's where I would start. In some cases, the families did me a service whereby there might have been six children who could have inherited the clock, but as time went on, they died before they had any children of their own or whatever, and so it kind of whittled its way down. And the first one that I tracked down, I, I was um, down in, uh, we have a house down in Connecticut, and we were down there vacationing, and um, uh I had been trying to get to this man whose name was Scott B. Wirtz, W-I-R-T-Z. He was the first clock that I found, but I had written to him because I had only found 
and, and physical address and I hadn't heard from him. And I think that letter is still in the dead letter file out in Iowa. But this one day that I was down in Connecticut and I found where he worked and I didn't like to bother people at work and it was a Saturday, but there was, he's a financial planner. So he had an email address. And so I apologetically wrote to him and he wrote right back. And he said, you are on the right track. Give me a call right now. It's raining. Give me something to do. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I called this guy out in Iowa and I said, you know, the whole story. And he said, I am, in fact, I have the clock right here. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. And then he was able, he and his father, who's still alive, his mother, through whom this had come down uh, the line, uh, had unfortunately died decades ago. But his father was still alive and added to the story. And uh, we got into such a lot of discussion. <laughs> um, and, and really, I mean, it enhanced the history of the clock. It, it took it um, from Iowa to Delaware to Maine, from Maine to someplace else. I can't remember the whole journey. You'll have to read it in the book. But um, it, it was just fascinating because the whole history of the book was in the minds of these men. And, and there were side stories that were really interesting that I included while telling about the Buchanan clock. In fact, his, his name was Scott B. Wirtz. And I finally asked him, I said, so what's the B for? And he said, Buchanan. Of course. <laughs> so, but his, his clock came here in something like 1797 or something like that. It was a long time ago. So I had fun following up on all those. It was frustrating when I couldn't find, there was one clock I couldn't find and I, to this day, it kind of rankles me, but. And the family is, the last name is Nutter, N-U-T-T-E-R, which is a common name around here, but none of the Nutters have the clock. So. So do you think um, it's worth checking out like auctions? Do you think it might have, you know, the family lost track of it? Do you think it might still be in the area? Well, I, I do think that the family lost track of it. Also in tracking down the family themselves, um, I think that they had fallen on hard times. Um, and I did track down that family over in Barrie, Vermont. And they knew nothing about the clock. I read to them about the clock which, from the town of Barnet, uh, the history of the town of Barnet. And they said this was the first that they'd ever heard of it. And at one point it had been sold by a family member. And then the story was that it had been, and I think this is in the history of Barnet, that it had been then bought back by another family member. But when I tracked that family member's line and got to the current generation, they knew nothing about it. And I think they sold it. <laughs> I had one guy who in his living room, I was sitting and talking and the clock is like, right across from me. And I asked him, you know, could I take a picture, please? And he said, oh, absolutely not. And you cannot tell where this clock is. You can't, you can't divulge who gave you any of this information. <laughs> so it was kind of like deep throat. And um, uh, so I had to write the chapter kind of carefully about that particular clock so as not to tip anybody off as to where it was located because this man was convinced that thugs would come in the night, drug, drug addled thugs were going to come in the night and steal his most precious possession, that clock. So I had to honor that, <laughs> of course. Well, it just adds a little bit of mystery to the story. It does. And I think Thank you.
one of them, one of the chapters of the 16 chapters is about karma choling. Um, years before I moved to Barnet, I was going to Peacham, where from time to time I would attend church at the Peacham Congregational Church and um, and go out to Martin's Pond. And um, anyway, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, um, uh, of course, coming in to Peacham by way of the highway, you pass Karma Choling, and I wondered what the heck is that and um, my friend, Mary Daly, who lives down the street here, in fact, she and I both moved here from Fairley, um, and she was the reason that I was coming up here and going to church and all of that. Um, uh, she, she said, oh, that's Karma Choling, it's a Buddhist retreat center. And I thought, a Buddhist retreat center, what the heck is it doing in Barnet, Vermont? So that became, of course, one of the things that I wanted to find out. Um, and when I talked to the, the people from Karma Choling, who I thought would be helpful in telling about the history, because I really wanted to find out the history of the founding, how did it come to be here? And to a man, I could not, from the local people, find anybody who was informed enough or remembered um how it all came to be so i started investigating who might have been there got in touch with people elsewhere in the country was at times on that mission talking to people in hawaii colorado obviously because um they moved from here to colorado nova scotia new york city and that was how i was able to put the whole story together i got in touch well, one of one of the people who was helpful, Fran Lewis, just died maybe two or three weeks ago at most. Um, she was one of the people who founded it and um, helped found it. And other people who were across the country were just incredibly helpful in tracking down that story. So that was fun. There were, yeah. Times when <laughs> uh, I, I talked to people all over the country, all over the country and Canada. The story about the Galbraiths, uh, which is one of the chapters, they were one of the very, very early families that came here. And um, they moved from here, they, they were quite a large family. There were seven children to begin with. Um, they, they knew that their, I'll, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I'll be accurate about the greats, but their great, great, great grandfather had come here, had purchased some land here in Barnet and elsewhere, not far from here in Vermont in what is now um, kind of the, in the Sheffield area, Sheffield Burke area. Um, and this is before the Revolutionary War. And then the story was, printed in the um, history of Barnet that he wanted to get back to Scotland, but of course the borders were, were closed. Um, so he could not get back into Canada or leave by way of Albany, which was one of the customary ways, or New York and Albany, um, to get back across the ocean during the Revolutionary War. When he heard that Burgoyne was coming down, um, he took, he, he decided that this was the time to, to leave Barnet and, um, and try to get back because he thought Burgoyne was going to win. Uh, and he got over there and ended up being captured and suspected as being, um, a spy got marched with 30 other men into Montreal where he managed to um, find either a cousin or a brother, or some relative who vouched for him, but he had to get the heck out of Dodge fast. So he got on a ship that took him to the East, was it the East Indies? No, the West Indies, West Indies, I think. It took him two years to get back to Scotland. Um, but the family, never knew the whole story. 
And one night I was on my computer doing some research on that particular story and ran across a book that had just been published in Saratoga, Boston Spa, Boston Spa, near, not far from Saratoga, by a armchair historian like myself, whose phone number I took down because I was reading portions of his book and he talked about a Jack Galbraith, now our guy was John Galbraith, um, who had been captured and marched with these 30 people. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, because none of that was known by the family. All they knew was that he had been suspected of being a spy, but they didn't know what the circumstances were or how long it was between the time that he left here, got over to Saratoga, Burgoyne was toast. So the things that were going to open up and happen as a result of Burgoyne's expected win didn't happen. And um, he got stuck. He got stuck over there and he went to work for a farmer who was also a militiaman. Anyway, the story's in there. But I called that man like at nine o'clock the next morning and I said, you're not gonna believe this. But I have, cause he said in his book, I don't have any more of this story. And I said, guess what? I think I have the other half of this story. And then I was able to tell when he got back to Scotland um, because his son was born. He had a son born after he got back. I mean, that kind of helps up the date. <laughs> <laughs> That's so that, was, that was amazing to to converse with another author and then i i'm a novice at history other than you know what we all learned in high school and i do have an interest in reading history books you know books that tell historical um stuff but um uh but trying to understand the importance of Burgoyne, I had to reach out and I found, uh, I think it was the professor from Marquette University who is an expert on um, that part of the Revolutionary War. And so I emailed him and I said, listen, here's the story. What, why, would he, why would he go over or go thither, as it says in the history, to the Saratoga region when Burgoyne came down, what was he hoping for? And so that guy, the professor uh, at, at Marquette, helped me understand what the importance was of that historical, um, why, you know, why. Which happened a number of times. I reached out a number of times to professors in order to be sure that I, had the story straight or understood the under, underpinnings, which would be really hard to get from a single history book. I looked, you know, I looked in all kinds of history books for the importance of Burgoyne and Saratoga to a person trying to get back to Scotland, but I could never put it together, not the way that this professor helped me to. It's great hearing about all the connections that you made as well as the, you know, the new leads to other stories that maybe uh, take you to, could take you off in another direction for another book. Uh, I think Joanna, Johanna had a question before. Oh, it was, it wasn't a question. It's a snarky story. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, not really snarky. It's funny. Um, my understanding of the history of karma chilling is not that exact, but I remember the big, big kerfluffle when the first leader died and there were big articles in Time Magazine and National Press and the heir, the next, the yeah. guy in waiting mm -hmm. stayed at my sister-in-law's house with his entourage. Ooh. And that's up on Max Mountain Road here in Peachum. Mm -hmm. And the funny part is that that house had a sign out front, it was called Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. And my sister-in-law thought that was tacky when she bought the house. So she took the sign and she put it in the basement. They stole it. Who stole it? Oh. Buddhists. They did? <laughs> Buddhists <Okay>. stole it. 
<laughs> so we don't have the Shangri-La sign anymore. Was oh, it down at Karma Trolling somewhere? You know, I've only been there. I had a, a good friend from college whose brother was there for a very long time. And we went to visit him once. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I had my eyes peeled, but I didn't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that leader is long gone also. So, you know, this is oh, this, What the year second was it? Leader? The second what? leader? The I second. think so. Oh, they're, they're on there. Uh, the, the first leader died in his, at age 47 of um, the, well, the result of alcoholism and drug use. The second fellow um, had AIDS and thought that if he, um, that, that good karma would keep him from um, infecting the hundred part or more partners that he had. And then it took the, uh, san the Sangha, the community, a long time, too long, they felt, to drum him out of town. And then he died. And then there was a period of time when they really didn't have a leader uh, in place. And then um, um, the current leader, who of course has made the headlines, um, uh, um, came to the fore in, uh, was it in the late 1990s or somewhere? And it, it's, it's all covered in here. And of course, he has gone down in shame. Um, He's back in, I believe he's in India right now, and there's, Karma Choling is struggling mightily, mightily to try to keep itself afloat um, financially. Um, it's sad. I think uh, it meant a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm pretty sure I'm talking about the second guy. I, will, I mean, this is random. Well, the it's second guy was Ocel. Um, you know, uh, a few times in your, your life, you see somebody who's so um, beautiful that you almost can't talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this guy was, you just, I, I feel like such an idiot saying this, but he was just, oh, <laughs> you couldn't talk. Charismatic. Then, he was so charismatic. No, he was beautiful. Oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> I did, he didn't open his mouth when I was around him. Oh. Well, his name was Thomas F. Rich. He was from New Jersey. <laughs> and, um, but in Karma Choling, he was known as the Regent Ocel Tenzin. There you go. And he was, he was both misled and misleading, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So there's no leader now? There is no leader now. That is correct. There is there is no leader now. They're they're struggling. They struggle. They're struggling in Colorado. They have sold off lots of uh, real estate in order to pay off legal bills and to try to stay as much afloat as they can. There are a number of their members, uh, teaching members, who've been arrested for um, sexual misdeeds. Um, and they're, they're absolutely, they're reeling, they're reeling. It's, uh, very sad. It's very sad. It's, the first guy was a philanderer of the utmost <laughs> degree. The second guy, obviously, Regent Tenzin was also a, a philanderer. It really tells a lot about the susceptibility of people to following a leader whose flaws are not hidden at all, but their, their charisma and their power of authority has such a hold on the membership that the membership allows things to happen that they would not normally. So that's basically what happened. And it was happening again this time. Um, but there have always been members of the Sangha who have been very vocal and demanded. This, the most recent um, scandal came, you know, during the Me Too movement. And um, so they were very vocal they, and demanding that he be removed remove himself took him months to do so but 
Um, the economy here in Barnett has changed a great deal as a result of, of all of that, which has also been interesting. Oh, I, this was the question I would have. Did you learn about that? Yes, yes. It's, it's, well, I think I talk about it a little bit in the book, but okay. a lot of people here had um, rooms, um, beds, bed and breakfasts, um, camps on the lake. Um, they had other real estate and depended on the influx, which was great, of karma choling for all their programs to fill those houses and to bring in um, money. And the same is true for the quick stop at here in West Barnet. Before that, the store, you know, it brought in a lot of traffic hmm. um, and a lot of commerce. And um, so I personally know um, quite a few people who bought property for the purpose of renting out that property and are now trying um to redefine how it's going to be used because then they were going to open this past april they were going to reopen but of course we got hit with covid so there's no reopening happening everything is they're all zooming too <laughs> so um uh you know there was hope until until covid came and the reality of how shut down we are and how shut down we are to the outside, um, that we're not bringing all those people in every week <laughs> to no. go to the meditative sessions or the classes or the programs or, you know, whatever. We go on retreats or, it, 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 it was a stunning blow economically to both Karma Chulling and to Barnett. And probably into Peachum, I would imagine. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for sharing some of the stories. I don't know if anybody else has a question. I'll just unmute everybody and. Yes, speak up. <laughs> I just have a quick one. Yeah, I noticed the cover of the book is of a waterfall. <laughs> yes, the falls, yeah. What's that about? Is that a. Um, this is, we're particularly proud of this. This is an, a 19th century engraving, steel engraving of the Great Falls on the Stevens River. You can see it if you are um, on Route 5 uh, in Barnet, depicting the earliest known rendering of the old Barnet Bridge. So there it is. And the cover is quite stunning, I think. And um, also in the back, we decided to run the um, Barnett Great Falls, another kind of, a, we had a page left over. <laughs> and we said, why not run the falls? So there they are. They were um, a hydropower source. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, those are the ones that a lot of people don't even see anymore, right? Since the interstate came since in. Since the interstate came in, it's really you just hard. Go straight up Route 5. Yep. More in East Barnett. the entrance on to 91 or to get up to 91, and then you go into Barnett Center and turn left. And make a left Just before turn. you get there to where like the store used to be on your left. I always used to look forward to that before the interstate opened. <laughs> it yeah. meant almost in Peachum. Right, yeah, it's, um, it, well, there's the concrete highway bridge that you can see, whoops, whoops, it won't help if I hold it that way, will it? No, I can't, this is all backwards, I'm like, um, but there's the concrete bridge that goes over the falls that you cannot, it's hard to see now, like you said, mm -hmm. it's hard to see, but that's where it is. Yeah, I think Green Mountain Power actually has the. Actually, yes. Yes. Yes, they have the rights to the hydroelectric that's partially produced there. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to order a book. Where do I do that? Um, well, well, you could order from me right now and I will take down your name. And do you have an email address and I can send you how to do that? I do, I do. 
Yeah, what I have yours, I think, is it speak from one that's sovereign? It is. Yeah, okay. Then Email I'll, me and I'll, and I'll send you how to do it. I'll write, I'll write to you and then you have yes. my Okay. That would be perfect, Herta. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kathleen. It's just so terrific. It's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> Twenty dollars plus plus shipping, or what is it? Uh, Herta, I could probably bring it over to Peachum and save you the three dollars of shipping. Um, we do ship all over all over the country and Canada. Well, we, we can email. That's fine. Yeah, we'll email. But that but for anybody else who's curious, email me. I think you all have my email, and um, email me, and I'll make sure that you get one if. If the library doesn't mind, I can drop it. Herta's off at the library. We would be happy to be part of the Pony Express delivery. Okay. okay. <laughs> Without <Thank you>. ponies. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you. Very it, much. Might, it might go faster than the U.S. mail these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. So I'm going to leave you all and uh, I'll write to you. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay, great. Bye, Thank you so much for joining Thank us, Herta. Thank you, Susan, for doing this, too. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you for being it was really fun. Super. Excellent. I'm glad you had fun. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to okay. wait for a book now on karma choling. Yeah. Right. A whole, a whole book on karma choling? No, there's not enough to write about. <laughs> uh, well, there's probably more to write about. My, my interest was narrow. It was just how did it get started? which you can't tell without telling a little bit more, you know, beyond the actual starting, but. It's, the hum, it's a humdinger of a story. It is a humdinger. It's I, I have, if you decide to do it, I'll give you a little bit more besides the Shangri-La story. <laughs> well, here, here's another um, stolen sign. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they used to have this sign out in the front. This is the actual very first sign. Mm -hmm. And um, it was regularly taken down by mischief makers and Barnet. Uh, and th fortunately, they never stole, stole it. They would take it down and throw it into the weeds. And then um, <laughs> Armacholing would resurrect it and hang it back up. And finally, I guess they decided they could do without a sign. As we all know, you have to know where Patnode Lane is. <laughs> it's unmarked, so there's no sign there now. But it's I like the, uh, the Hookerville cutoff. Do you know about that? <laughs> they, gave up, they renamed it. <laughs> so we all know it's the Hookerville cutoff. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can rename things, but people have memories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can never kill it. <laughs> Thanks well, a million. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you for attending. Good night, everybody. I'm going to end the Zoom session. <laughs> Be peaceful. Be safe, everybody. Bye.